Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. Well, I uh, I did. First of all, I love the Tomcat and um, I wanted to fly that before. I, you know, I, when I joined the Navy, that was the plane. And of course, everybody wanted to fly, you know, fighters. When, when, when you all get in, uh, I went through uh, aviation officer <laughs> yeah. candidate school and, uh, that's where you come in as a civilian with long hair and they, the Marines was, you know, they shave your head and yell at you, PT you and, um, everybody came in, they all wanted to be fighter pilots. That's kind of what they, they all want to fly fighters. <clears throat> well, once you start flight, so you go through that program, you become an officer, then you go to flight school and that's when mm-hmm. things start to change. Uh, some people, uh, you know, some people went helo, some people went big wing P3s and there's advantages to all. Uh, if you went to the big P3, oh. you're never going to go on, you're never going to fly out on the aircraft carrier. Therefore, and you get uh, per diem, you get actually more money <laughs> when they go on deployment because they're away from home. So they go into Spain, they go into the great places and they'd be getting more money and, you know, but that you know you have to fly the big P3 to do that, and you know it it was you know they'd be long long missions. Um, so I knew I wanted to fly wow, fighters okay. when I when I first got into uh, the training command. There there still you could still get F4s, Phantoms. Uh, there there was only one uh, organization, one air wing that had them. They were a four deployed in Japan. And they were the last. They had two squadrons. They were the last Phantoms in the fleet. <clears throat> And I, and I, for a while, I thought, well, that'd be kind of neat, you know, to be able to, because you knew that eventually they were going to be phased out and fly the Tomcat. And and so when I got my wings in 86, mm-hmm. that was a consideration. But I I wasn't really ready to move to Japan because you had to go to Japan for that. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I wanted to be at Miramar. Uh, my, my whole family was in Southern California and, you know, San Diego was beautiful. So I said, I'd, I'd just soon be stationed at Miramar. That's the, the big best base in the Navy. And fly the Tomcat, which at the time was still fairly new. I mean, it had been around for uh, almost a little over 10 years at that point. So that was my first choice. <clears throat> and then fortunately for me, I got my first choice, mm-hmm. not not because of class standing, because typically the number one uh, graduate gets his choice because that's you know, it's incentive. You you know, you want to get people to, to do their best. Not that we all weren't doing our best, but I was not the number one guy. <clears throat> and what's really dangerous is if you let if you let your standing dictate who gets what aircraft, if everybody wants to fly fighters, guess where number one graduate, number two, number three, yeah. they all they would all go fighters. And then the other communities were like, oh, we get I see we get the guys who didn't do as well. You know, so they came up with this program called Quality Spread and which the number one guy always got his choice. But the number two guy, well, he was almost as good as the number one guy. He's not going to go if he wanted to go fighters and the first guy took the fighters. He's not going to go fighters because the quality has to be spread throughout the fleet. So that that's what you had to worry about when you got your wings. Yeah. Like, am I going to be one of those guys? Because um, you, you want to do well. But like I said, if you did number two or three, you may not get – and here you, you were almost as good as number one, but you don't get what you want. So luckily for me, I was in the, like the top third. And luckily for me, <clears throat> I got I got what I wanted, Tomcats. And so I uh, got to Miramar, and I knew at the time uh, – you know, Miramar had been there – for years and years and i knew individuals who had actually been at miramar from the day they got their wing you know they got their wings they moved to miramar and they never ever moved they they would go out they go an operational squad and all the squads were on the base miramar uh and they would take turns going operational on the uh, aircraft carrier for three years and then you could go be an instructor at shore based at right. the uh, uh rag the our replacement air group and then you can go back to another school. You, you do the seashore rotation, and that keeps you burning out so you're not out at sea for 20 years straight. And I knew individuals who had done that for 18, 19 years straight. They just they just flew, and they'd go to an adversary unit, or they'd go to the wing, or they'd go to the rag, go to Top Gun. All, those are all the shore-based, but you're basically the same place, but you're not going out to sea. 
And and that was my objective, was like to be at Miramar for 20 years, flying the whole time, and then and then you know retire and, and move on or what have you. Well, that was going very well because I I I, I went to my first fleet squadron. I became a F-14 instructor at the RAG. I went back to a second F-14 squadron. I went to the uh, the wing. I went to my third F-14 squadron and, as a department head, and then I was going to go, try to go to Top Gun from there. At this point, though, the the uh, Congress got involved with trying to save money, and they have the base realignment committees, and they would start sh- shutting down bases to save money. Well, right. it, they shut down a, mere, uh, a, ba- a Marine Corps base up in L.A., El Toro, which was their jet base for Marines, right? It's, it's Orange County, not too far away, but and it had been there for years. So anyway, they shut that down. So the Marines had to have a place to go. They, at this point, are downsizing. They're not building any more Tomcats. And uh, you, you continue to have some attrition, you lose some Tomcats. So they were going to, they came up with a great idea. We used to have a West Coast at Miramar, East Coast at Oceania. And they said, we're going to single site all the Tomcats to be at one base. And it was, oh, which base? Well, as it turned out, it, got, it was Oceania. So all the Tomcats from Miramar had to move. Homeport changed to Oceania. That became the master Navy jet base. Miramar became the Marine Corps base, because the Marines, they shut down El Toro. They moved all their uh, planes and, out, and it's a huge base now for the Marines. Okay. And, and, and in actuality, it was originally a Marine Corps base. Uh, uh, when it was first developed, it was a Marine Corps base. So it's not like we gave, they, they took it back, essentially. So that was the first, like, oh, so much for my plan. And I, I'd been there for, you know, what, 12 years at Miramar and, and three okay. different squadrons and, and had a great time. But now I'm in Oceana. And, and it was in the same squadron, by the way. So it was a, it was a home port change. They, they don't occur overnight. You you have to phase it out. So I went on a deployment in 1996 on the Carl Vinson and the F-14D with uh, the Red Rippers VF-11. And the plan was we, we arranged for everything before we went, we went on our six-month deployment uh, to, so that when we flew off and we did our normal Westpac in the Pacific Ocean, Persian Gulf, all the <laughs> yeah. standard stuff, but when we came back, instead of flying into Miramar like we normally would, we flew over Miramar, <laughs> and we had Air, Air Air Force refueling, and it was kind of sad because you know, we just flew directly over over Miramar all the way to Oceana, landed in Oceana, you know, hours and hours later, and that was that was our move. So so I'm no longer in Miramar, but I'm still in the Tomcat and in the D. Um, a, we had had some attrition. Uh, these these knuckleheads in uh, our sister squadron. When I was in VF-11, the sisters again we still had two squadrons per air wing. The sister squadron was VF-31, the Tomcatters, and so we, we both had Ds. And uh, two guys were trying to get a, a great photo op with carrying six right. uh, Phoenix. They weren't real missiles. They were ca- uh, carry missiles that that help the plane feel like it's carrying. And they they look like it, but they're not. Anyway, but but for you know, all intents and purposes, they they look like it's fully loaded with these six missiles. They're trying to get pictures, cool pictures. Guess what? They hit each other, and they actually so so two Tomcats crash, and and so now we have two two less Ds, and we're at this point where the the beam counters are like, you know what? We don't have enough uh, with the forecast attrition and all the maintenance issues. We don't have enough for two Tomcat squadrons per air wing, we're going to go to a slightly larger single Tomcat squadron per air wing. And and so my squadron that I was in, VF-11, even though we weren't the ones that screwed up and hit each other, oh. we were designated as a squadron that had to, had to go back to the F-14B. We were in the D. We had to go to the B. So there was swapping around. I ended up getting almost, I, I ended up getting, at one time I had way more F-14D time than I did F-14A time. But because my command tour was in a B, uh, it almost ended up being equal, like F8, F14A, B, and D. I had time in, in all of those. Um, uh, but anyway, so in Oceana, flying the Tomcat, uh, I, I finished my department ed tour, and uh, that's when I got to go to Top Gun as an instructor. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, when Miramar cl- okay. became a Marine Corps base, that's where Top Gun was, it, it relocated up to Fallon. Nevada. So I had to move to Fallon and it, it got absorbed. It, it, Top Gun was its own entity, its own squadron. If you ever read the history, I mean, it, stu- it stood up originally as a debt, just a bunch of extra instructors and extra airplanes that put it together. And then it became a squadron. And, and because it, it becomes such a, a powerful entity, it, uh, when it got moved up to uh, Fallon, it got absorbed 
into the larger command, which is headed by an admiral, uh, Naval Strike and Air Warfare Center. So it's 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 a department now. It's not a squadron. It's a department inside the Naval Strike and Air Warfare Center. Which yes, you know it's it, the guys in Top Gun didn't necessarily like that. It, it it was like they were their own squadron before. Now they're just department. So it was it was not as good. I mean, it still did the exact same thing, but it was just a lot of the it's because it, it, it's it's not it's not an easy tour uh that that's probably if you talk to any top gun instructor it's probably not uh it was probably their most arduous tour because you're working long long hours it's very re- rewarding and you'll probably find that you'll you'll never be any better because you're not you're, not, you know, you're teaching the teachers at, at top gun you, you're not just training students in, in the early days you take like when i went through top gun as a student um you would be trained by the Top Gun squadron and structure, and you go right back to your squadron, and and the idea was to disseminate that knowledge. You know, now you're the you wear the patch and you are the go-to guy in that squadron. You usually have four or five, six guys in the entire squadron. Um, the concept sort of changed where went, especially when it went to Fa- uh, Fallon and it became the Strike Fighter Tactics Instructor Course, where you you teach the teachers because now we we're going to stand up smaller weapon schools mm-hmm. at at every fighter base that we had that was going to be run by the graduates that we trained the teachers that we trained so they were going to be the the uh, the guys in the fleet uh, even though they weren't in the squadrons they're at the individual weapon school at at in Oceana or where have you Lamore um but that yes. they were the go-to guys for all the fleet squadrons to go so we would train them at Top Gun to be instructors and that's where they would go you had the option maybe to stay on as an instructor at Top Gun, um, but and that's where you stay in Fallon. Again, it was it was pretty arduous tour because you, you know, you worked really long, long hours at Top Gun. It was very re- rewarding, but not not much of a. Uh, you know, I, I told you about the shore yeah. sea rotation. This is shore, so you're supposed to be sort of resting and refitting to go back out to sea, and and it was a, again very, very arduous. So so that's. That's when I started my my family and I started moving every you know I was at Miramar for for whatever never had to move and now I'm moving every year and a half or so because from here I went to the War College and you, you only do that for a year uh, and then then I screened for command and this gets back to your your question about I, I wanted to stay in the Tomcat we still you know the the, the community was getting smaller but uh, it was still around and it was still doing great things and. Um, when they asked me when I screamed for command, they were like, well, you know, do you want to go to the, one of the new Hornet squadrons? And I was like, you know, that sounds good, but I just soon finish. I want to fin- I started with a Tomcat. I'd really like to do my command tour and finish with because I didn't really think I was, I was going to be doing much after my command tour. I, I'd actually plan on getting out, retiring after I, my command tour. And and I, you know, I'd hoped that they were going to follow my my de- desires. And sure enough, they called me up the next week. Congratulations, mm-hmm. you're going to this squadron, which was a Tomcat squadron, but it was one of the very first ones that was going to transition to the Super Hornet. It had yet, but so I, I was in. It was VF. Uh, it was at the time VF 102, the Diamondbacks. And um, so we went there in Oceana as as Tomcat guys. Uh, and then the timing was such. I got there in August of 2001, and of course the next month was uh 9 11 wow. and we were already scheduled for a deployment uh on i mean that those schedules are out a year b- before that um we we knew we were deploying september 19th so my my initial thing was well, how are we going to leave a week early you know are we going to leave tomorrow or next day but they didn't they you know there's there's already carriers you know there's a couple carriers already out there always is so the idea is no you guys are going to stay on time so <clears throat> we we took off on september 19th pulled out on the uh, roosevelt and then went through and and I'm thinking, man, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be moving over there fast. Ironically, I'm sitting there with the captain of the ship. I don't know why he was doing it that night because, you know, he has other people he could. But it was just me and him nice and quiet on the bridge. And uh, and we we're talking and we're like, we should shouldn't we be going, you know, like as fast as we can to, you know, the AOR where we could start because nothing had happened yet as far as fighting. But we, we figured it's coming. And we're, you know, we're, and, and you know, if he knew, you know, he didn't relate to me. He's a, he's an 06 and I'm an 05, but I mean, he, he, he wasn't like, he didn't let me know the big plan, but we, it didn't seem like we were really hightailing it to get over there really quick. And then, you know, the next few days, now we're in the Suez Canal and in the middle of the day, and I might be a little bit paranoid having watched <laughs> 9-11 go down, but here we are in this big vulnerable aircraft carrier going, you know, three miles an hour in very tight space. 
and during the mm-hmm. middle of the day, and I'm like, good gosh, it would just take some terrorist in a Cessna full of dynamite, you know, take out our island, and we're done. We'd have to, you know, we'd be out of it, but we, we supposedly had the protection of our, our Egyptian allies or what have you. Didn't see anything. You know, we were all up there just kind of, I'd, I'd never been through the Suez Canal before. And so I was just up there on the flight deck, kind of just watching land go by. And uh, so then I thought, all right, well, at least we're, we're through there now. We're going to get in the you know, Indian Ocean and the Persian, or uh, towards that side. And uh, and then, again, they started they started the combat uh, operations. Uh, and so we got there just after that. And uh, we had a, a day and a night carrier. So so the carrier that had been deployed had already been out for, for months. They got to go home when we got out there. And I'm, I, it's been, you know, 20 years. And I'm trying to remember all that. I think the, uh, the Lincoln was uh was one of the ships and i don't remember if it was the one that wow. took off or what we, we had double duty there we had we had two for a short very short period we had three aircraft carriers there the off going the one that was in the middle and then we just arrived and then but we're the new guys so you know we, we sort of got to get used to what's going on and uh so we as a new carrier we, we became the night the night team so we were there for uh that was at the time uh, congress mandated maximum deployment lengths to six months to help in retention well, that that went out the door, of course, because of, of 9-11. So we were there for seven and a half months. And at that time, it was the longest mm-hmm. uh, cruise since the Vietnam days, you know, because Vietnam, they'd go out for a year. Uh, it, was, it was crazy uh, back then. But uh, so it was it was a lengthy cruise. We dropped uh, more ordnance than than uh, any other uh, air wing mm-hmm. uh, because we, we timed it right. You know, the other the other ships had been there. So. They were sitting there steaming until they, the fighting started. Then they had to leave. Well, we were there for the whole thing. So we ended up dropping the, dropping the most ordnance in our squadron, got the Clifton Battley, you know, the, all the awards for, for great things. And it was a really good time for our squadron. And, and the, the best parts, we, we never lost a single person. I mean, not that many cruises, uh, yeah. you know, you go and come back with everybody. It was my yeah. biggest fear when I got to a command level, that that was my priority. I, I never wanted to come home with one less sailor than I when I left, uh, for for those kinds of reasons. And we, you know, despite flying combat missions, despite being uh, deployed for longer than normal, uh, we we didn't lose one person. And, uh, and and you know, not not in combat, not in training. And we came back with everybody. Uh, and it was quite quite the event because we were the uh, again the first carrier that that deployed post 9/11. And, and when we came back, it was a, a fantastic you know, welcoming home. And, uh, it was very, very, uh, <laughs> gratifying. A lot of my friends who had gotten out and were either flying airlines, you know, disgruntled with the military. And I, and I kind of understand that because, you know, you, I had been in at this point, I've been in 18, 19 years and never really got to see, I, I flew in the Persian Gulf and I flew some, some missions, but and you know, we'd, we'd, we'd paint, uh, Iranian hostiles on our radar, but we never engaged. And and here, you know, here we are. We're we're dropping bombs every day. We go out and we're we're seeing things and destroying things. And and I mean, I hit every kind of uh, target imaginable yeah. from tanks, uh, troops in the open, uh, anti uh, aircraft artillery, caves. You remember when we were trying to caves? Everything, uh, airfields, everything. I you know I got to see and and do. And I mean, I think I saw every square inch of Afghanistan. It was it was just very interesting. Um, but after all that, and then we come home and, and again, we, we hadn't lost anybody, but that was the last time I flew the Tomcat when we, when we flew off the aircraft carrier, we landed because we knew our squadron was transitioning to the Super Hornet. We were, we were only the second, uh, Tomcat squadron to, uh, to transition. And again, I won, I would have preferred some of my contemporaries that were fortunate enough. They did their, their full command tour. Uh, and in the Tomcat and finished. But so I only got to do a portion of that. Uh, and, and then I had to go to Lemoore and transition to the Super Hornet. And of course, there's a certain period of time where you're you're uh, you have to transition. So you're not operational. In fact, it was almost a year where we're in the sort of transitory mode. And that's that's not as much fun. We, we moved to Lemoore. <clears throat> and I thought I was going to be done with my command tour. And they and we had been in an air, air wing for all of a month. When my air wing commander said, "Hey, uh, Scar, you are you're not staying in our air wing. You, you're you're now going to go to Japan and be the forward deployed mm-hmm. squadron." Japan. So, as you recall, I remember when I first joined the Navy, there's two F4 un- uh, squadrons in Japan. Well, they they obviously got replaced by the Tomcat. At this mm-hmm. point now, decades later, in 2000, this is 2004, Tomcats are the aged aircraft and. Uh, the the, yeah. the commanders in Japan were very concerned about uh, a potential 
uh, aircraft, you know, crash because because it happens. Uh, the population density in the uh, the towns and city near uh, the uh, Navy it's base in Japan yeah. is like New York City. If there was an accident, if something just falls off the airplane or, or gas spills, it's it's going to be a big. So so they're like, we want the best and the newest and blah blah blah. So they they basically swapped out the Tomcat squadron that was there, and my squadron now VFA 102 flew did a, a couple of trans packs and we replaced that squadron. So so it was it was a long tour for me because I started it in the Tomcat in Oceana, mm-hmm. went to Super Hornets in Lemoore, and now I'm I'm super the latest Super Hornets in and the first and only Super Hornets in uh, Japan. So for that time that I was there, our squadron was the only Super Hornets, and we had three uh, other Legacy Hornets in there, and we were mm-hmm. we were tank the Super Hornet. You know, we were the tankers because this, at this point they're starting to get rid of even the S threes uh, that. Out of the tanking, so we were we were tanking. We were we were doing all kinds of interesting things, and I had a whole bunch of new guys because um, the Tomcat community transitioned, and we also got a few Legacy Hornet guys uh, to sort of help us with that transition because the 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 Super Hornet is eighty mm-hmm. percent like the old Hornet. I mean, it's it's bigger and it's got diff- slightly different things, but it's basically a Hornet still, and it, and it made for mm-hmm. interesting challenges because the Tomcat was completely two different nice. uh, cockpits. What one did, the other couldn't do. And, and the, for the mission to happen, he had to do his job, he had to do his job, and you had to coordinate. It, it was very important. And the Hornet, the Super Hornet, we went to a two squadron F, you know, Super Hornet squadron, exact opposite, the cockpits are exactly alike. And the plane had been flown by a single pilot as a sing, as a legacy Hornet, and again, it wasn't that much different. So there were some growing pains mm-hmm. because it was almost like the 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 the, the Wizzo now instead of the Rio in the back. It was not as I think fulfilling because again he had his own duties and uh, mm. that he had to perform in the Tomcat. Whereas now it's like well you know either guy could hit this yeah. button and it's going to happen and quite often it was a a race to who hit this first and then you ha- you know it it got to be a little kind of a a pain in the yeah. butt now. They eventually fixed that by decoupling the cockpits, which was is is great because now the backseat can do certain things without interrupting what's going on in the front. So in, if if he needed to, he could actually be working an air to ground, um, you know, radar while the guy in the front is is working air to air radar, and because uh, they had ASA radar, it was a a, a better. Yes. You know, much yes. much better technology. The the F eighteen, obviously, the technology can't be compared to the F fourteen technology. It's decades ahead. Um, and, and and that part I obviously appreciated in, in the Super Hornet, and it was it was neat to see the progress. And we were just getting the that new helmet uh, as I was leaving. Um, so it, it was it was interesting to see. But you know, your your heart was sort of like back in the Tomcat, and I yeah. and I had done. You know how many years I, I and I started flying Tomcat in '86, and it was 2004. So we're, we're talking eight, 18 years, um, yeah, 18 years in the Tomcat, yeah. and and now I'm doing my last, uh, yeah, so I, not even a, a year and a half in in the Hornet. Uh, that's an easy one. The best thing is you, you're not in control of the airplane. <laughs> Uh, per se, I mean, uh, you you obviously have the uh, the ultimate control if if need be, you know, eject um, uh, that. But I tell you, I, the best thing was what I kind of alluded to earlier is knowing that to, to perform your mission to the to the best of this aircraft's ab- uh, ability, if you got two uh, okay, air yeah. crew that are just in sync. And that's why we would always tend to crew the same individuals together. I'm not saying that every day, it's not every day you fly with the same guy, but more, you have what's called a tactical organization in the Tomcat squadron where you are a crewed up pilot and Rio together. And you, uh, all, in all probability, should be flying together if, if somebody's sick, obviously, there, there are special ex- ex- circumstances. But more often than not, you're going to fly. And that's so you can sink so that at a certain point, you know what the other guy's thinking or trying to do and and you can you okay. you actually beat him to the task of Absolutely. if you get that kind of thing going I, you know four eyeballs two brains is better than one eyeball and two you know or two eyeballs one brain so so i think the best thing was was being able to deliver 
uh, more uh, of capability as a team. The the bad thing again, especially for pilots of Wizzo, is that that you aren't you aren't flying. But but I'll tell you, your, your mind quickly it, it focuses so much more on mission. I think most mm -hmm. uh, uh, civilian pilots, of course, think, oh, this is this is cool. I'm flying. And it really, all you're doing is flying from point A to B because you're not you're not out dropping bombs or shooting missiles. But see, that's what I I enjoyed so much about tactical aviation is that the flying around is the kind of boring. You know, I mean, you just get airborne. It's like being in an airline, and you just you know you're flying from point A to B. That's not what it's about. It's about employing missiles and dropping bombs, and and that that's where you're very. I tell you, my my uh, one of several of my missions in Afghanistan were eight hours, and. And it seemed if you told me if you told me, hey, how yeah. long do you think you're airborne? I would say an hour and maybe two hours because you're, you're just so focused on the mission. So uh, that that's where it's at. So that, that's the bottom line for Alex. That that answer would be, well, you don't have you don't have direct control of your put. But but a lot of times, I, especially when you're flying with junior junior pilots, you, you're really directing them quite yes. a bit. Uh, okay. Well, obviously the the aircraft, and like I talked a little bit earlier, is in the Tomcat, you f the pilot could not do the things that from the front seat that had to be done to employ, uh, you know, the way it was designed to employ both air to air and air to ground. Um, so you had to do that in the Tomcat, otherwise the mission wouldn't happen. And like I said, in the in the Hornet. Uh, but keep in mind now, I was in it in the Super Hornet when it was brand new, and I, I'm certain things have sort of evolved and changed. And and with that ability to decouple the cockpits, that had to be a huge. It, they they hadn't yet achieved that when I was flying it. It was exact same co cockpit, and you know if you hit a button, it changes his you know up front. So um, that that would be that would be the the biggest uh, number one thing um, difference wise. The, the the second thing with technology. I mean you know the technology uh, in the in the Tomcat was just it was it was antiquated in in many ways. You, you could argue, hey, if it's not broken, you know, don't try to fix it. But uh, but when you see some of the things like <laughs> yeah. like a new like when a new computer comes out or a new app, and you're like, well, how did I ever how did I ever do this before I had this phone? It's kind of like that. You're like, oh wow, this this is nice. I remember flying with the. Uh, uh, when, when we transitioned, one of the guys I was flying with uh, was just amazed. Yeah. Physically flying the horn, he's like, man, it's, it's like it's almost on autopilot the whole time. It, it's just like the digital, you know, the mm -hmm. plane. The Tomcat, they have to train, like the old days, you have to trim, you know, trim the plane, <laughs> otherwise it's going to do this. And you're, you you got to be on it. Well, the, this one, he's like, man, it's it's like the plane's on on autopilot. You know, you, you put it in the turn, you let it go, it's going to hold the turn if you straighten it up yeah. it goes straight you know it, which makes it kind of easier and it was always much easier to land on the aircraft carrier than the tomcat which made it. um so so that that'd be number two is the technology uh uh man i'm trying to think number three i i kind of i don't i don't even know that this is so much attributable to the difference in aircraft as much as just the evolution of of the navy and I don't want to get into any kind of a, a political discussion, but but the ethos in warfare has changed dramatically in the last you know 30, 40 years. Because when I joined, uh, men men still, could still have beards in the navy. Uh, there were there were no women in in combat, and and now it's all different. And I and I got to see kind of firsthand the the integration of all that, and it wasn't as smooth. And a lot of the time, it's because it, some things are politically driven instead of operationally driven. And I, I don't think you should ever use the military as sort of a. And, and, and don't get me wrong; it makes it sound like I'm, I'm anti. Um, you know, I, I had some of the best performer uh, pilots and, and whizzos that I had were, were women. Okay, so that's not what I'm saying here. I'm saying how it happened and how it was integrated was not the best because you have some some admiral who feels under the gun. To make something happen, it says these will make it through. Where it was as me or my fellow do, guys, maybe we wouldn't have had that opportunity, or, or maybe if we screwed this up, we're out. Well, it wasn't that. <clears throat> and I think at least early on, you saw a little bit of that in in the performance uh, factor. Not to say, uh, you know, again that that they're not up to the task they are, but it's just how it was implemented. Uh, so that was not so much a difference in. Aircraft A to B, Tomcat to Hornet, but it's just evolution mm -hmm. of society and and how we fight how we fight basically nowadays. Um, and 
it, it's in many ways it's 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 better you know technology makes things easier but yeah. um it's uh it was it was not a smooth uh, as smooth a road i think as it, and i don't know how it appeared to the outside world a lot of times the military does things so well and when you do things so well, people assume oh, it was easy then because, you know, you clearly can do this and you do it well. But that's not the case. Uh, it, it's a lot of effort and a lot of pain and suffering along the way. And that that was in a perfect example of uh, where yeah. we got to where we are today. Yes, uh, I play uh, I play guitar, as, as you can see. Uh, now, these are my brother's guitar because we both played. But uh, growing up, we were always uh, we were into two two air, two things, airplanes and, and guitars or music. Essentially, I was a huge again, getting back to the, the British. I was a huge I am a huge Beatles fan. And, uh, and they, you know, I, I was I had every Beatle record by the time I was uh, well, they were they were still together, believe it or not, when I was into them. Uh, you know, I was uh, I, I think I was eight years old when their last album came out. And I, I remember getting it right. It was brand new. And I and I, I mean, I loved them. So I always wanted to play guitar. I wanted to be in a band. I wanted to be like the Beatles. And uh, so sure enough, I uh, I had a, a band, uh, you know, very rough and uh, not very good band in, in high school. Uh, we got better and better in college. And then and then came times like, well, do I want to do this, you know, real. I want to be like the Beatles. Right. But I, I was like, I can't see. I went to college at this point and I was like, man, I can't see wasting my my college degree, I don't say it was waste, but the bottom line is if you go in the music route, I, I didn't want to be that, the, you know, the 50 year old man losing my hair, playing in a dark, smoky bar, making, you know, minimum wage. And I, when I had the opportunity to, to fly, so I flew, but I was always able to, I always had a band in every squadron I was in. I always found talented musicians. There's, they're out there. And so every, every single squadron I was in, I had a band. And what's really neat, though, is because Americans have this sort of uh, when it comes to music, we had this instant credibility when we pull in overseas. They'd always ask, well, do you have a do you have a band aboard the carrier that could play here? And they, they'd get to our squadron and say, yeah, yeah, these guys they are very good. We play rock and roll. And uh, so we, we played on every continent. And we, we don't get paid, obviously, but they would totally take care of us, giving us dinner, meals, drinks, uh, shirts, you know, m mugs or what have Amazing. you. So we had great times playing in Australia, um, in uh, du you know, Dubai, I mean, just e everywhere, Hong Kong, Singapore. And uh, so that that's my hobby. And since I retired seven years ago, I, I really that's all I do. I play I play lead oh. guitar in a classic rock band and I will send you a picture when we're done. And I don't know if you could incorporate, but I'm actually in multiple bands. And uh, one of the bands is as a tribute act. And I don't know if you're familiar with the difference between like a cover band and a tribute band. But a cover band will just play songs from another, you know, like Journey or Leonard Skinner or what have you. Play those songs. A tribute act wears like the costumes and plays the exact same guitar oh, and tries brilliant. to look. So like if you're in the audience, you, you, you might think you're at a and I'm in a Guns N' Roses uh, tribute band. And so I'll shoot you the picture of me. I play Slash, so I, so I wear the hat and the and the wig and uh, and we sound quite quite good, like like the real uh, band. And uh, so that's what I do. Uh, no, uh, with the only the only thing I do is assist my brother with his uh, aviation related movies. I do the music a lot for them. Uh, if, if you had the opportunity to see him, um, the music. His his son is also in a band and he does a hard hard rock. Uh, the, you you can tell the difference between him and and me. I mean, I love their music and I play that kind. But but for the film score, I do more of a, like a, a orchestral stuff. Uh, the, so when yeah. when you watch the movie, if it sounds like orchestra, no no singing, but orchestral type of sound, that's me. If it's hard rock singing, it's it's his son's band. So um, other than that, I have uh, you know the only air, aircraft flying we do is commercial. Um, I did get a couple tactical. Go flights after I was still in the Navy, but I was with the Air Force. We were on a base uh, where they had F-15s, and my neighbor was like the the director of operations. Mm -hmm. uh, so he he invited me because I was you know qualified not qualified oh, nice. to to fly it, but but qualified to go without having to do a whole lot. So I got a, a couple of flights in the F-15, uh, which was interesting. Yeah, and yeah. I'll keep in contact, and we'll definitely get you on again. Sounds great, Mike. I'd love to do it again.